Hello and welcome to a new episode of our EuroHealth podcast. My name is Jan Kusacek and our guest today is uh, Mika Salminen, Director of Infectious Diseases at the Finnish Institute of Health and Welfare. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, well, you are uh, involved uh, mostly uh, in uh, questions related to HIV and AIDS, uh, as far as I know. Uh, so let's start with um, a rather wide question. Um, what does it mean to live with uh, HIV or AIDS in 2023? Well, it's luckily it's very different from uh, from the very beginning of, of uh, the AIDS pandemic or the HIV pandemic. Uh, uh, and even very different from maybe just 15 years ago. Uh, nowadays, it's of course, um, in principle, uh, uh, a disease which uh, could be very serious and cause serious health problems for you and also um, could be transmitted. But thanks to the drugs um, that have been developed in the last uh, uh, 25 years, uh, actually the disease is very different. Um, if you are on the drugs, um, you uh, you have a, a very normal life. Um, you're not ill, uh, really. You have the infection, but uh, you don't really uh, have to be worried about getting sick from the disease itself. If you keep keep taking the drugs, and also you don't really even transmit uh, further. Mm -hmm. And. Uh is it different uh, in various parts of Europe, or uh, is it uh, pretty much uh, the, the the same everywhere in the EU and let's say the the whole continent? And how do you compare that with uh, the life with uh, with HIV in uh, let's say Africa? Because uh, we know that uh, hardly everybody uh, has access to the modern uh, treatment. Uh, it's of course very much dependent on on uh, what your access to the treatment is and. And, uh, and do you have to pay for it yourself, or do you, or is it fr freely available uh, for everyone? Uh, I would say that in Europe, uh, the access to treatment nowadays in the EU, especially, um, is uh, is is pretty good. There are still countries where there uh, is maybe need for improvement, but um, but though those uh, issues are less and less. Mm -hmm. um, uh, problematic, uh, except for certain certain uh, maybe population groups uh, and risk groups, there still may be maybe a problem. But um, even in Africa, the situation is much better. But of course, it's uh, highly dependent on the strength of the health system. So some of the African countries and also some other countries in the world, the health systems are not not so strong and and are not able to provide the care to everyone. Mm -hmm. Uh, across the EU, the data suggests a downward uh, trend uh, in uh, in new cases. Um, yet it's not the, the same case in Czech Republic. Uh, the, the the situation is pretty much different in uh, in uh, the countries of uh, of EU. Um, yet all across uh, the, uh, the Euro Union, uh, nearly fifteen thousand people are diagnosed uh, annually. Um, about half of them uh, are diagnosed at a uh, late stage, so uh, it impacts the quality of life uh, much, uh, much more. Am I right? Yeah, that's true. The, the late diagnosis is a problem which is quite hard to solve. And uh, I, I, I recently also in Finland we had, we had a case. It was a young woman who who had been feeling ill for some time, and 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 the doctors hadn't really found the reason. And then uh, she went in for some operation, and they did an HIV test, which is kind of routine, and was found to be uh, because of HIV. And then she got help. But but the problem is that um, uh, the sort of symptoms that you might have um, are kind of mild in the beginning, and then you have a long, long time where you have no in, uh, symptoms at all. So you don't know. Uh, not all people can kind of recognize that they would need a, an HIV test. Mm -hmm. um, and that leads to some of the cases being diagnosed quite late already when you when you start getting ill from the from the infection. Maybe uh, is it uh, also somehow connected to the fact that uh, these days, thanks to the modern drugs, um, 
it's le- less uh, perceived as a uh, death threat than uh, than let's say 20 25 years ago i remember when i was uh, at uh, at school uh, it was uh, so often repeated that this is like a death sentence and uh, this is something that we really need to be uh, aware of Maybe these days uh, kids just uh, or teenagers that um, young people in general don't don't feel uh, it's uh, such a big deal. Well, there could be an element of that, but I have to say that uh, this late diagnosis problem has been there uh, already from the beginning of the pandemic, um, and especially if you are not sort of uh, part of a population group which is traditionally considered uh, at higher risk, if you, if you're not a gay man or if you are not uh, using drugs uh, uh, by the injecting route. Uh, you might not perceive yourself as having risk, um, and actually, those those are the groups where where you have more of the late diagnosis. Um, at least uh, in most European countries, this is the case. Well, you, uh, I think you uh, hit a really interesting point uh, because uh, I would say that uh, general population believes that uh, if you are not uh, a drug user, if you are not uh, with experience in prison, if you are not uh, um, uh, of a sexual minority, if you are not uh, immigrant, then you are pretty much off the hook. Is it still the case? Yeah, um, I think... At least it's the case in the way that people don't even think about HIV um, necessarily. Um, uh, the large ma- majority of people, they don't even... And, and I think the, the demonstration that, that you have these cases, like the young woman I described, um, really kind of uh, demonstrated that, that yes, awareness is not there. Um, There was a, an active discussion maybe 10 years ago about sort of increasing the access to testing and, and do it more routinely as part of a health examination or, or, or routine uh, hospital visit. And I think that's actually a good strategy because then then uh, you would catch those cases earlier. Um, it costs a little bit of money, but uh, but on the other hand, you save a lot if people don't get ill and don't have to go to hospital. Uh, we already mentioned how uh, people uh, perceive uh, HIV as a, a as a threat, but uh, what about stigmatization? Do they uh, perceive this diagnosis and this uh, the the fact that uh, it uh, becomes a uh, known fact about them uh, a risk? There, is, there is unfortunately still some uh, some stigma which varies a bit from uh, from uh, the group of people that you're talking about or. Or even even uh, in Europe, a little bit uh, between countries. But I would say that generally, in all countries, there is still there is still a stigma about the disease. Uh, I guess because uh, so it's an it's in a way an STI, uh, sexually transmitted disease. Of course, it has been so so strongly associated with with uh, sexual minorities and uh, and drug use. So people are afraid that uh, they would be uh, uh, would be labeled as as a minority of of this sort, which which if it would be then known, they they fear that it would have effect on their their relationships and maybe work and and all of that, even though it shouldn't. But um, there is there is still this stigma. It has not been completely eliminated, unfortunately. Well, in Czech Republic, it uh, affects even the access to healthcare because uh, we know that uh, uh, many physicians uh, pretty much refuse to uh, uh, treat uh, patients with uh, with HIV, and they uh, they ask them to go to some specialist. But uh, when you know, um, when you are HIV positive and you need dentist, you need dentist, not not yeah, uh, yeah. not infectologist. So, sure. uh, so is it a uh, widespread uh, problem even in healthcare it, it is not unusual unfortunately this either and i think there is a lot to do in the sort of healthcare uh, education system and even within the maybe the profession the the, the uh, professional associations should should maybe educate 
um, their members better because nowadays all these issues can be easily dealt with. And the risk to the physician or the staff is actually very, very minor, uh, especially on people who are on treatment because in practice they don't have any virus in their blood. Mm. So, um, so going to a regular dentist actually doesn't need any very special uh, 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 sort of um, precautions because they will anyway clean up all the equipment after after each patient. So you wouldn't use the same yeah. same equipment for the next person without cleaning it up, and all those cleaning procedures are just fine. So, uh, so this is unfortunately a myth which exists still. And, and makes people scared, but uh, but in reality, the sort of uh, proper regular precautions that you should take anyway in in healthcare uh, are perfectly capable of of eliminating the, the HIV risk. Well, if there is any policy to be adopted in uh, in I would say modern <laughs> countries, uh, there needs to be a lot of data hard data, sure. uh, and uh, what about uh, data and uh, HIV? Is it uh, something that uh, we spent enough uh, time and money on as, you, let's say, European I think, countries? I think in, in Europe there, there's reasonable data on, on HIV, uh, on both the epidemiology and, and certainly on, on you know, um, the virus itself and the disease itself. Uh, we have some gaps. Uh, Uh, we don't necessarily know always uh, what's going on uh, among those people who, who inject drugs. Um, that uh, is is a constant sort of issue to to monitor it better for their own own um, well being also. Uh, but otherwise, in most cases, our, our sort of surveillance systems are reasonably good. Um, there are some some of course groups which maybe. May be hard to reach, uh, um, especially if you have multiple risk factors. Let's say that you would be part of a sexual minority, you would be part of commercial sex operations, and you would be using drugs. It's quite clear that in those cert- circumstances, people are more vulnerable, and it's much more difficult to to get the information mm-hmm. from them. But um, but uh, through various um, sort of outreach projects. If you are able to build a trust, um, it is possible. It has been done, and uh, you just have to keep keep working on it. Um, let's move a bit towards uh, prevention. Another matter of prevention. Uh, from uh, 2015 to 2019, you led uh, the Joint Action on HIV and Co-infection Prevention and Harm Reduction. Mm-hmm. That's a bit, a bit a long, uh, uh, long name. Uh, so, uh, what uh, actually was uh, your task in this uh, organization? Right. So, so this was. Uh, 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 Almost EU-wide, not quite, but but many many EU members uh, uh, collaborated. Um, so the European Commission has these uh, uh, public health funding instruments, where they encourage countries to work together to solve some sort of either research problem or or a sort of practical uh, health promotion uh, prevention project. And this was both actually. Uh, so we were the coordinators, um, the institute I work for, the National Institute, the Finnish National Institute for Health and Welfare, which is a public health institute, uh, research and public health organization. Um, we coordinated the network uh, in the in the partner countries, and then there were several, what is called work packages, sort of sub projects, basically, uh, that tried to address various issues. Uh, especially among um, uh, the higher risk groups, in, in this case, it was among uh, injecting drug users and, and populations that were close to those. Um, so, so we sort of uh, uh, put together the project in the beginning, and then we also managed the sort of day-to-day business. But, uh, uh, but most other partners then did, did the actual sort of uh, mm-hmm. sub projects. Mm-hmm. Um, and then 
What could actually be done uh, from the side of uh, public sector uh, in prevention and in minimizing the risk of uh, HIV transmission? Yeah, so the the project uh, tried to rely on a couple of uh, experiences that we had from the past uh, in in many countries uh, in Finland, but also in the European Union level, um, to work on harm reduction, because. Um, Unfortunately, the experience shows that it's very difficult to totally eradicate you know, drug use. Mm -hmm. it, it's a fact of life that it, it happens. Um, if you just close your eyes uh, about it, then you, you might miss a lot of, of uh, suffering and it might also affect other parts of the, the society. Um, so at the same time, as we work towards trying to reduce drug use through both prevention and, and control measures, uh, uh, which is needed, of course. It's illegal to sell drugs and, and, uh, and uh, 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 that whole business is, is, is very, very bad. Uh, but then you, uh, it is very pragmatic to try to at least help the people who are in this addiction um, so that they could avoid some of the health risks that are there. That will help them to po possibly Uh, get rid of the drug use uh, and prevent them from being ill uh, in a disease which would then be costly for society also, not to speak about their own suffering, of course. So, uh, so we used the tools that are available for harm reduction, which means needle exchange services, low threshold access, anonymous access to, to various health services, to social services, uh, and a lot of um, non-governmental organization uh, partnerships uh, with the public sector. Uh, and these kinds of, of, uh, of uh, approaches to, to this very hard to reach uh, population group has been successful in many countries to, to reduce the risk of, of uh, a transmission of not only HIV, but things like hepatitis C, hepatitis B, which are also bloodborne diseases. Um. I guess once again we we see some duality between uh, the the harm reduction approach and the pure repression and uh, pre pressure on the user's uh, approach. Uh, do you think that there are some uh, I would say groups of countries within EU that uh, opt for this or for another uh, approach? So. Um So that this is a, has been kind of a sort of a slow evolution of policies. So if we just go 30, 40 years back, most countries in, in, in Europe were mostly doing repression. So, so try to control the, the, the sort of use of drugs and the selling of drugs, which is all still necessary. Uh, you have to be pragmatic of that. But then over time, there was a realization that, okay, we cannot get rid of this problem very quickly. And there are people who are suffering because of it. So we have to take care of them also. And, and that is, has been the trend in the, in the last maybe 30 years. Uh, started actually in the UK, in the, in the Netherlands, and uh, spread then to uh, Portugal, to Spain, to uh, uh, Germany, uh, the Nordic countries, except no, Sweden has been quite sort of a bit more, uh, or let's say, less less enthusiastic about the harm reduction. Uh, they have now services, but they are not that widespread. Um, then, of course, also um, in the newer EU, EU member states, um, there are activities. Uh, I think there's still more work that, that would be good to do, but, um, but uh, I think this concept of harm reduction is, is more accepted nowadays than, than before. Sometimes it dep depends on, on which political mm -hmm. party is in, in power and you have to educate them a bit and it might take some time. But because the problem is, is that you often hear that, uh, well, you give them the, the tools to use the drugs. How can that not be bad? And the, and the thing that people don't realize is that even if you wouldn't give the, the tools, which are clean and, and prevent them from, from getting the infection, they will use the drugs anyway. And that means they will use the neighbors. And, and that is just reality. Uh, and, and this is 
in Finland, we have developed this this very pragmatic, dualistic uh, approach that we are not giving up on control, but we acknowledge that uh, uh, we also want to reduce the harm. Mm. Actually, I think that uh, after I had here quite a few guests who are involved in harm reduction, and not only in relation to illegal drugs, but to tobacco use or alcohol use as well. So uh, I feel that the countries that uh, prefer more pragmatic and uh, more data-based ap- approaches usually opt for um, more pressure on harm reduction. And uh, those who uh, are more driven by, uh, I would say, political proclamations uh, they tend to uh, just uh, just be hard on the on the users yeah this this is so uh, I think uh, each country has to go through a certain evolution of, of acceptance that you know we can't fix everything uh, and then we have to somehow find a way to to live with the situation of course you need to try to develop the services also in the health sector in such a way that people who have the addiction could actually get rid of it. That is very important at the same time as you, if you just do harm reduction and you don't try to give people opportunities to try to get rid of it, uh, that's not good either. Uh, then you sort of close your eyes in a, in a different way. But if you just think that you can solve this social issue with the police alone, Uh, I think even the police will say that uh, it's not it's not possible, unfortunately. At least the smarter policeman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I understand you must have been asked this question a hundred times, but uh, I must uh, ask it once again. Sure. Uh, well, how were lives of uh, HIV positive uh, people influenced by uh, the COVID pandemics? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Um, Uh, I don't have good data on, on that, actually, to, to be honest. Um, well, now we see one area of possible yeah. improvement of data. Yeah, uh, that is true. Um, of course, the, the fact that many things were closed um, was, was a problem. Access to sort of regular health care was restricted for many diseases uh, because of the COVID pandemic. One thing which is very obvious is that that many such groups that were already in a, in a precarious situation actually suffered more than the general population. You know, I'm I'm a civil servant. Um, even if things were closed, I could still do my work from from home, uh, distance work. It didn't affect me that much. It was very bad and and boring and, and unfortunate, but But then if you live on the street and you have to get your next next uh, uh, dose of drug or you go into horrible uh, 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 withdrawal or they close the services that, that you, you actually have because of, of COVID, that is actually a very, very big problem. So, um, so we know indeed that in Helsinki also we had, we had uh, 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 substantial problems with with those who were using drugs, and we actually saw after the pandemic a small increase in the transmission of HIV, um, which I don't know if it's associated, but it's it's in time it's 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 a bit worrying indeed. Um, and one last, a bit frivolous question: uh, sure. if you were to uh, assume. Uh, powers of European Commission for a day, what would be the measure that uh, you would uh, try to implement or what what one thing, if you could just pinpoint, uh, what one thing you would try to change? Well, I think the most important thing is to to make sure that uh, uh, the, the effective drugs are are available to everyone who resides in whatever country. That means, you know, the, the citizens, Uh, the drug users, the sexual minorities, the immigrants also. Because if you leave one part, part out, that is a risk for further spread. So it doesn't make sense. Uh, it's People say it's a cost issue. In reality, it's not. This, these drugs are cheap nowadays. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, 
The other thing which might be more controversial is that um, we have recently come to the conclusion that the punishment for using drugs is not useful. Mm. Uh, it just puts people in the margins. Um, and you know, they're just hurting themselves actually. It's a different story if you sell drugs. That should yeah. not be allowed, of course. But uh, but punishing people for being addicted to drugs doesn't really cure them. So, so that could be abolished. Great. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for coming sure. to Prague. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here.